Wa alaikum salam, Mamar. All right, inshallah, I'll get uh, started. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'aghfiruhu wa na'uzu billah min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyi'ati amalina. Man yahdihillahu falamudillala wa man yudlil falahadiyala. Ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wa ahduhu la shirika la anna muhammadin abduhu wa rasooluhu. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكلوا كولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم May yati Allah wa Rasuluhu fakad faza fawzan azima. Amma ba'd. All thanks and praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek his help and his forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of all our deeds. And whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whosoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone without any partners and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu is his servant and his messenger. My dear brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, I am so grateful to be here once again to reflect on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with you. I'd like to remind myself first, and then all of you watching and listening, that the Quran is the final authority for us as Muslims. The Quran not only contains the word from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it also contains guidance. And the Quran was recited by Angel Gabriel to the last Prophet of Allah, the seal of all the Prophets, Muhammad sallallahu And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, his family, and his companions. Allahumma ameen. When we claim ourselves to be Muslims, we are saying that we submit our free will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody else. But what does that mean? This means that we're going to disobey our personal desires when it inclines us towards acts of rebellion. And what are these acts of rebellions? Any action that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an act of rebellion, as simple as that. And the Quran is filled with stories of acts of rebellion that were displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we do commit an act of rebellion, we are encouraged that we should come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when we rebel, we're not only rebelling against Allah, but we're also rebelling against ourselves too. The nature that Allah has given within us. So we need to recognize this, that there is no benefit to us when we rebel against our nature or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if it's an action that we perform intentionally, we need to recognize that uh, what we're doing is not something that would be pleasing. And we should always then come back and find ourselves returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in that moment, there's nobody else uh, that we can hold to account except for ourselves. So when we recognize this, you know, we should realize how much we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Every time we commit an act of disobedience, we should come back. Sheikh uh, Ibn Atayla, in his book, uh, The Book of Wisdoms, or Kitab al-Hikam, says, the source of every wisdom, the full source of every disobedience, indifference, and passion is self-satisfaction. The source of every obedience, vigilance, and virtue is dissatisfaction with oneself. And what the Sheikh is trying to tell us here is that when we engage in actions that is pleasing to us first, then it is likely that we are serving our desires. And conversely, when we are engaging in actions seeking the pleasure of Allah, then it is likely that we are setting our desires aside in that moment in time. So let us remember that where the Quran does not spell out specific details on acts of worship, we then look to the Prophet ﷺ for guidance. And one example of this is our salah where the Quran tells us that we need to perform salah, but how we actually perform it comes from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And if, if there's ever, ever any doubt in our hearts about the sunnah uh, that the Prophet ﷺ acted in accordance uh, or outside of the accordance of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we are risking our iman, we're, we're compromising our faith. And once we submit our will to Allah, it becomes incumbent on each of us to shed the cloak of ignorance to seek Allah's pleasure. And the best way to do this is to build a relationship with the Quran. And I don't just mean a transactional relationship. For example, 
If we only think of the Quran when we want to look up a story or look up a ruling, then we are dealing with the Quran as if it's a transactional relationship. That is, we're only visiting it when we need it. But to build a true relationship with the Quran, what that means is that we are visiting with the Quran often. And we are doing this not just when we need guidance. So just like when we yearn to visit with people we love, we should develop that yearning for the Quran as well. When we have a relationship with someone like that, we both benefit from it. The benefit is bi-directional. The other person benefits and we benefit. And this benefit can come in many forms, including spiritual benefit or physical benefit or emotional benefit. So how does the Quran benefit us, you might ask? Abu Umama reports in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet Sallallahu said, recite the Quran for on the day of resurrection, it will come as an intercessor for those who recite it. And with this, I would like us to direct our attention back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beautiful names. So today I wanted to reflect on two of the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Muta'ali and al bar The meaning of Al-Muta'ali is supremely exalted. Now this, this word is very closely related to another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Ali, which means the elevated. And Al-Muta'ali is an elevated form of Al-Ali. So it lays greater emphasis on the exalted nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, one of the examples we find in the Quran is in Surah ar rad verse 9, we're told, Alimul ghaybi wa shahadatil kabirul muta'ali. He is the knower of the seen and the unseen, the all great, most exalted. So in this verse, we should learn that there is nothing in this universe that can claim greatness, can, 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 can claim greatness above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in our mind, uh, the most exalted should tell us there's some kind of a hierarchy involved. And as a people, we're inclined to rank things all around us. You know, one thing is better than the other. And it's a natural tendency. This is part of our nature. To help us understand this better, you know, we like to put things in either order of importance, order of prestige, or order of value. So if we use this as a way to wrap our minds around what does it mean with Allah being the exalted, we can take the example of a king. So the king is usually the highest ranking person within a land and then all of the subjects below him. And the king also sets up administration, the people running the government affairs on the day-to-day -day basis. And these people would be lower in rank than the king because the king can appoint them and also take their appointment away at his pleasure, at his discretion. But on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Allah will sort us in ranks based on our actions. So the disbelievers will be sorted in one group, and then the believers will be sorted in another. And then among the believers, there will be a rank. And among the disbelievers, there will also be a rank so that Allah can judge us all fairly. And Allah will assign these ranks so that each of us is treated in accordance with what we used to do. And we know this also from the Quran. In Surah Al-Aqaf, verse 19, Allah talks about the believers and the disbelievers. And Allah says, Each of the two groups will be ranked according to what they have done. So he may fully reward all and none will be wrong. And Allah uses the word daraja. Daraja means uh, rank or degrees. And Allah is telling us that he will treat everyone fairly, even those who are disbelievers. And the degree of our deeds and actions, where they fall, is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to rank us. So the greater the degree of good in our action, the better it will be for us on the day of judgment. And while we're living in this world, you know, we believe in the oneness of Allah, and we believe on the day of judgment. And if that's the case, then our focus should be on how we earn the pleasure of Allah. There's an authentic hadith where Anas reports that the Prophet ﷺ said, it is Allah's right that nothing should be it, nothing should be exalted in this world, but he lowers it. Meaning there is no creation in this world. There is no station that we can assign that will be greater than that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing can eclipse the presence and nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's now talk about al-bar, which means the doer of good, the beneficent one. Al-Ghazali tells us that the most exalted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the source of all good and beneficence. Every form of goodness 
beneficence, generosity, and kindness comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether the benefit is inwardly or outwardly, the source of this benefit is the same. That is Allah. And we also know this from the Quran. So in Surah Luqman, verse 20, Allah tells us, Have you not seen that Allah has subjected for you whatever's in the heavens and whatever's on the earth and has lavished favors upon you, both seen and unseen? And by seen, Allah is referring to the outward favors or benefits. And by the unseen, Allah is referring to the inward benefits. So what would be examples of each? So if we look outwards, we have trees that bears fruit. We have vegetables. We have uh, crops that grow. And all of these give us nourishment. We have permission to slaughter certain animals to use them as food so that we can gain nutrition. And we can also take the skin, for example, of some of these animals and use them as protection or use them as ways to cover ourselves. We can think about rain. You know, water is needed by not just us as people, but also from, uh, for plants and all the other creations that Allah has in this world. You know, none of the vegetations, none of the crops would grow uh, without water. Even the plants that are really drought tolerant, that can really go days on end without any water, even those need some water. And if we start looking inwards, what are the inwards benefit that Allah has given to us? Uh, the one that comes to my mind is the brain. You know, we know through science and the study of how the brain works and brain waves, we know that there's electrical currents that are produced in our brains. And these signals in our brains, these electrical currents travel at different speeds. And the speed of the wave is indicative of the state of our mind. So for example, if we're in a relaxed state, our brain is producing what scientists would call alpha waves. And these are alpha waves, that are waves that are traveling in lower frequencies. And some scientists would say that this is actually a good way to reduce depression or stress. So when we wake up in the morning and we're feeling relaxed, it's a sign that our brain is producing alpha waves. When we are concentrating, our brain speeds up a little and produces what is called beta waves. And when we are learning, the speed of our brain increases. There's higher speeds of electrical currents. Scientists call that gamma waves. And this is just one of many examples of the unseen benefits that we enjoy. We don't have to tell our brains, uh, go into alpha wave mode, go into beta wave mode, and so on. Nothing needs to be done. We just live our lives, and this is the system and machinery that Allah has created for us that just happens automatically. So another example that comes to my mind is when we engage ourselves in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you think about the last time you meditated, if you do meditate, your focus would have been primarily on your breath, taking measure, being very intentional about how many seconds you hold your breath when you breathe in, how many seconds you exhale that breath when you breathe out. And breathing for that period of time in and out puts our brain in a state of alpha waves or in a state of relaxed being. And if we spend our time remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are focusing our attention on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his magnificence. And that singular focus should help put our brain in a state of relaxation too. So if we go to the Quran, we'll find a verse that talks about this. And this is a verse that many of you have probably heard many, many times. In Surah Al-Rad, verse 28, we are told, Allah bizikr Allahi tatmi'inul qulub. Surely in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find comfort or rest? So when our heart is in the state of comfort or rest, we know from science that our brain is likely in beta or alpha state. And this benefit of relaxing us is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By simply reciting the name of Allah repeatedly, intentionally, or praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly, intentionally, knowing the meaning, and doing this with the intention and understanding that this act is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should trigger us to enter a state of bliss. Why? Because just like meditation, where we focus on one thing, our breath, our focus on Allah takes our mind away from all the distractions of this world. And just like that, our bodies relax and we are engaged in an act of worship. And Allah reminds us in the Quran, in Surah Tur, verse 28, that the people who will find themselves in paradise will be ever so grateful to Allah for their accommodations. And these people in paradise will ask one another inquisitively about how they live their lives in this world. 
you know, if they can recall any of that information and if they can share that information. And then they will tell one another, Inna kunna min kablu nabuhu innahu huwal barrur rahim. Indeed, we used to call upon him alone before. He is truly the most kind, most merciful. Alone. This is what the people of paradise are saying to one another when they try and recall and they are grateful. They will say, we used to call upon him alone. Now they're collectively in paradise in a state of gratitude, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, the most kind. Imagine being one of the people of paradise. Imagine the excitement we will feel when we learn that we have made it to Jannah. It will likely feel like the end of a trial. The world that we used to live in would feel like a blink of an eye. And we will try and remember all the moments we acted in a manner that is pleasing to Allah for no other reason than to count our blessings, to feel that gratitude. And in that moment, we will feel like we did the right thing. And our bliss will replace our worries of the hellfire. And inshallah khair, may Allah grant all of us entry into paradise. Allahumma ameen. In the same chapter and in the very next verse, Allah addresses the Prophet and says, So continue to remind all, O Prophet, for you by the grace of your Lord are not a fortune teller or a madman. And then that's what majnoon means, is, is to be a mad person or a fortune teller. So Allah is reminding the Prophet ﷺ, and by, um, you know, by indirectly also reminding all of us that we should continue to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should continue to perform deeds that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and continue to remind everyone who is on this path with us that there will be a day when each of us will be held to account for our actions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our understanding of the Quran so that we all may begin to and continue to live our lives under the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah increase us in knowledge and give us wisdom that gives us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it the most. <clears throat> My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we live in troubled times where more and more people immerse themselves in their own desires. And such is the world, has been always. Um, this, should, this is not news to us. This shouldn't be news to us. It's the YOLO, as it's called sometimes, or you only live one mindset. We see this in you know, everything from self-help gurus telling us to look out for number one as the old maxim goes, or book writers and bloggers, media personalities, consistently redefining, reinterpreting for us how we should behave and live our lives. And it's no wonder sometimes, at least to me, uh, uh, is that you know, we, we easily get misled. And if we believe, as I alluded earlier on to what Sheikh Ibn Atala said, that is the source of every disobedience, indifference, and passion is self-satisfaction we shouldn't need to look very far than our own selves, for examples, to bring this wisdom to life. You know, think about, um, think about a time when we try to justify an action that we may have committed. Once we're able to justify that action, then think about how we felt in that moment when we were able to say, yes, now I feel just. What was that feeling? Was it a feeling of satisfaction? And if it was in that moment, then we should look at that moment as a, mat as a matter of learning, as a matter of a learning opportunity. You know, we live in a time when people are keen on finding nuances in everything, not just their faith. And they do that just so they can say, you know what, I knew it. And then they're happy, they feel satisfied, they feel vindicated in some small level or some grand scale, you know, depending on the person. And our Prophet ﷺ warned us that as we come closer to the day of judgment, Holding on to our faith will be like holding on to a rope that is on fire. And when we allow ourselves to falter, when we allow someone who challenges our faith or talks in nuances that is uncomfortable or creates that uncomfortable feeling in our gut, it is a sign for us that we need to build a stronger relationship with the Quran because there's a whole lot more that we need to learn. 
In an authentic hadith, Ibn Umar narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said, the likeness of the Quran is that of a hobbled camel. It is, it's its owner ties its rope, then he will keep it. But if he loosens its rope, he will lose it. So it's important for us, my dear brothers and sisters, that we build this relationship with the Quran. Make sure we hang on to this Quran. Don't lose it. The stronger our relationship with the Quran, the closer we will be to receiving some level of satisfaction with the actions that we do every single day. And until we find ourselves in Jannah, we should never feel like we have done enough. We should never feel like we are good to go. We should always feel like we need more to do. There's more that we can do to build that relationship with the Quran. And the Quran encourages us to build our relationship with ourselves, our communities, our families, and so on. There are rights and responsibilities that Allah tells us we have in each one of those circles that we travel in. You know, So how can we do this? One way we could do this is by spending more time and reflecting on what we read in the Quran. Or if we're trying to recite, the Quran recite it with more grace every time we read it or spend more time memorizing as much of the Quran as we can. Let's pray, my dear brothers and sisters, that you know, we all receive Allah's guidance. May Allah accept all of our hardships, all of our du'as, and may Allah accept our hearts and its intentions towards him. Ameen. Allahumma ameen. Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat, wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minat, wal-Qanitina wal-Qanitat, wal-Sadiqina wal-Sadiqat, wal-Sabirina wal-Sabirat, وَالْخَاشِئِينَ وَالْخَاشِئَاتِ وَالْمُصَدِّقِينَ وَالْمُصَدِّقَاتِ وَالصَّائِمِينَ وَالصَّائِمَاتِ وَالْحَافِظِينَ فُرُوجَهُمْ وَالْحَافِظَاتِ وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذِّكْرَ وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ عَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا رَبَّنَا حَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ وَاجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا رَبَّنَا فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا وَكَفِّرْ عَنَّا سَيِّئَاتِنَا وَتَوَفَّنَا مَعَ الْأَبْرَارِ رَبِّ اجْعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّاتِي رَبَّنَا وَتَقَبَّلْ دُعَاءَ ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا عليك توكلنا وعليك انبنا وعليك المصير ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا انك انت العزيز الحكيم ربنا امنا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وانت خير الراحمين ان الله يامر بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون لا اله الا انت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام للمرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين اللهم آمين